So young people, I just wanted to take a look through um, kind of where we're going to get to. But before we get to that, we just want to start again with, uh, with another question to just kind of frame our minds what we're going to consider together uh, in our studies tonight on Genesis chapter 13. So just thinking in your minds, when you're faced with a big decision in your life, what's the thought process that you go through? What's the process that you go through in your mind to help you make the right choice, the spiritual choice? There's some big decisions that are being made by the age group that's represented in this room. Perhaps some of the biggest decisions you'll make is at the age uh, that we find ourselves in in this room. So what's your process? How do you decide where you're going to go to school? How do you decide whether you're going to go away for school or stay local? Whether you're going to live on campus or off campus? How do you decide what your major is going to be? What career path you're going to choose? How do you decide what you're going to look for in a potential partner? How do you decide when you're ready to get baptized? Big decisions. How do you decide? Young people, in Genesis chapter 13, another big decision is about to be made. We're going to work our way through these verses together tonight to see what advice we can take away when we have to make big decisions in our life. We might face challenges, we might face trials or decisions. We want to try to see what are some of the most effective ways to go through that to ensure we make the right choice, the godly choice. What can we learn from Lot in Genesis 13? So before we get to that, let's just uh, kind of step back and go up 20,000 feet in the air and just take a look over what we're going to go through uh, the course of, of our studies together. You know, the study into the life of Lot is one where we see the importance of sound spiritual leadership. It's a study where we see the importance of spiritual decision making. We see the importance here of reactions, responses, and results. The study of Lot touches on the principles of marriage and of raising a family. It's a study that forces us as Bible students to look inwards, to consider our own commitment that we make to God, to think about where we put our focus in our own life. What is it that drives the actions and the decisions that we're making? And we started yesterday, we considered Genesis chapter 12 together by, by way of exhortation. And we looked at this aspect of separation and how it arose in the very beginning of our introduction to Lot in the record. We looked at the importance of maintaining that separateness amidst the world around us. We considered two opposing views, and we titled those the difference between being a tent thinker and a city dweller. And we know that it had nothing to do with literally living in cities. Most of us here probably live in cities. It was all about a way of thinking, developing a mindset that is pleasing to our Heavenly Father. Cities were all about the advancements and improvements in man's ability. But by removing that, we can start to focus on what God would have us to do, to be tent thinkers, to be ready to leave it all behind. And of course, we saw that we are to cultivate a way of thinking that is eternal by removing that which is temporal. Well, this evening we're going to spend time in Genesis chapter 13. We're going to work our way through the decision that Lot is about to make, a big decision that Lot is about to make in his life. In our third and fourth classes, we're going to consider Genesis chapter 19, the fateful night in Sodom with Lot and his family. And finally, our fifth class together is going to focus on the words that are found in the New Testament concerning law. What can we then look, looking backwards? What are the key lessons for us that we can walk away from this week and apply directly into our lives? So to begin together tonight, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 has recorded for us words that are applicable for any study that we go through. I like to call this, uh, this verse one of those highlighter verses. You want this verse to stand out in your Bible. If you have a pencil or some kind of coloring crayon, highlight it. This is a very important verse for us anytime we study the Word of God. 
Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, like Genesis chapter 13, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so what we know is that this study, this study in the life of Lot, God's word that's recorded for us in Genesis chapter 13, may have been recorded thousands of years ago, but it's as relevant today as it was then. There's a message of incredible hope tied up in those words. And these chapters and these characters were recorded for our learning, to teach us something, to warn us, to encourage us, to strengthen us in the year 2018. This is how we're going to treat our study together through the course of this week. This story, the life of Lot, has been recorded so that you and I can study it this week. That we can learn from it. And ultimately, we want it to strengthen our faith, our purpose before our Heavenly Father. And the study of Lot is one at times where we seem like we might be on a bit of a tightrope, a slack line that's out of something. We're balancing different ideas. We're balancing the lot that we read of in Genesis with the lot that we read of in the New Testament. Struggling to maintain that New Testament view of lot with what's recorded in the Old Testament. We have to be able to balance that a just man can still make mistakes. That a man who would vex his righteous soul can still make poor decisions. We have to understand the weakness and the failings that we read of, and then weigh that with the understanding that Lot was righteous. And while Lot was certainly different in many ways to Abraham, in some ways he clearly was not. And they would have been similar in the faith that they had. We must not forget that. There has to be a balance in this study. Well, looking through the lens of a verse like Romans 15 and verse 4, we see that these things were written for our learning. And so we're going to examine Genesis 13 together tonight through that view. Because it's here where we really start to see where those choices, big decisions, are being made in the life of Lot. Of course, Lot's going to have to live with the consequences of his decisions. Oftentimes when we read and we study, we try to rehabilitate Bible characters. We try to rehabilitate Bible characters instead of just recognizing that their choices, their errors, are there for us to learn from. Even a just man has to live with the consequences of his actions. It was going to hurt his family. It was going to cause great harm. He had to be prepared and ready to leave everything behind. But the incredible part in this story, in the life of Lot, is that we can see both the goodness and the severity of God. These things were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Well, let's come back in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 13. Because here we pick up the record of Abram, Sarai, and Lot coming up out of Egypt. And it was there that Lot had witnessed a poor decision made by Abram. And Lot is about to make one himself. They come to a familiar place. Let's just pick up in verse 1. Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. Abram was very rich in cattle, silver and gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, from the place, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Aon, unto the place of the altar which he had made at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So coming up out of Egypt together, after a very difficult experience, Abram comes back to Shechem. He comes back to that area between Bethel and Aon. And did we notice the way that it's recorded? It says where his tent had been. Unto the place of the altar which he had made. He's back on the east of Bethel. Where he had pitched his tent in Genesis 12 and verse 8. It's an important lesson that comes out of these verses. 
It relates to our decisions and how we deal with possible negative consequences that come up from decisions that we might make. Because Abraham goes back to the place of decision. He goes back to rededicate himself to God. He recognizes that a mistake has been made, but he goes back to recalibrate, to focus on his Heavenly Father, to face the house of God, Bethel. There's no pride, there's no arrogance in the way that Abraham does this. This is what good Christadelphians should do. Recognize that God needs to be part of the path moving forward. That there are going to be times when we have to recalibrate, refocus, reprioritize. We have to come back to that place of decision and choose to go to Bethel, to the house of God. And yet we see in those verses the consequences, don't we, of what that trip to Egypt did for this family. The substance that they left with is now too much, as it seems. They cannot dwell together. It's interesting, though, I know it came up in a few of the discussion groups today, that in verse 7, it mentions that the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in the land. Why would it tell us that? If two nations could dwell in this land, why could two families not dwell in this land? And yet we know with that great substance, something happened. There was strife between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abram. There is strife over the space that's available for the herds and the flocks. And so Abram approaches Lot. He said, let there be no strife between me and thee, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. The situation was approached in the right way to try to deal with strife. Abram knew what we learn later on in the New Testament as it relates to strife. In Galatians 5, I don't have to turn there, but it's the chapter which lays out the fruit of the Spirit, and it describes the works of the flesh. And listed there is strife. It's a work of the flesh. It needs to be dealt with. It's the same message in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 3. The carnal mind is full of strife. James 3 verse 16 speaks of strife as adding to confusion and evil work. And so in the right spirit, this issue was to be dealt with immediately. It needed to be resolved. And not lost in these verses is a simple lesson for each one of us. Here was a seemingly small issue. It was a small issue. It was just strife between herdsmen over an amount of space for their flocks. It was a disagreement. It was an argument that could be solved by a simple separation. There's a term that we're probably familiar with. It's called the butterfly effect. It states that small causes can have larger effects. It was actually called this because of the metaphor of a butterfly flapping its wings and that reverberating to potentially bring about a tornado. It was a metaphor that was used to show that even something small can grow to be something large. Small decisions with big results. And with Lot and Abram, hindsight of course being 2020 for us, how important this small coral was going to be. The decision that resulted from this argument, a small thing to a big decision. Even in the seemingly small things in life, we cannot forget how big the decisions can be. Here was a seemingly unimportant outcome in the lives of these two men. You go that way, I'll go that way. And yet there's a lesson. We have to be careful, young people. Even in the small things in life. Those decisions can have big results. And so here are these two men standing on Bethel overlooking much of the Jordan Valley with a, de a decision that needs to be made. And Abram offers Lot to decide where he will go first. What direction will he take? Well, let's read in verse 10. It says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, 
and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent <coughs> toward Sodom. Now let's be clear. These are some of the verses where the balance in the life of Lot needs to be struck. But young people, all we have is what's recorded. So what do we see in these few verses? We see a difference in decision making. The first thing we notice in these verses is the emphasis on Lot's actions. Lot lifted up his eyes. Lot beheld all the plain of Jordan. Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Now just cast your eyes down to verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, Lift up now thine eyes. All the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it. There's a clear distinction once again between these two men. The record emphasizes that one made a decision for himself, and the other was directed by God. And we balance scripture with scripture on the character with Lot, but also recognize the difference in simply what's recorded. Lot chose for himself. And this plain of Jordan, the word plain, it means a circuit. It was a lush circuit of cities that lay to the east of where these two men were. Well, what else do we notice? Lot saw Jordan. He looked east. He didn't need to look behind him, did he? He knew what was there, and it didn't interest him. Behind him was Canaan. It was a place that was lacking the lushness of the Jordan Valley. There was something to the east, though, that caught the eye. And we might be tempted to think that reading through verse 10, we come down hard on Lot for his decision. It says that he saw the plains of Jordan, that it was like the garden of the Lord. Perhaps his mind was on the garden of Eden, on spiritual things. But we have to keep reading. Lot's name, we know, means a veil or a covering. And we know that the purpose of a veil is to hide something from you. And here we see that come across, sadly, in Lot's decision. Because while a wonderful comparison is made, it's like the garden of the Lord. See how even that was veiled. It originated from this thought of Egypt. It was like the land of Egypt. Egypt was where this whole problem had started from. The increase of herds and cattle. If Abram hadn't gone there, Lot wouldn't have been able to compare Jordan to it. But young people, Egypt affects the mind. And here Lot compares the garden of the Lord to the land of Egypt. <clears throat> Lot likened the truth to the world. He didn't see a difference. He couldn't separate the two. See, what's going on in his mind, his eyes were veiled. And he goes straight towards Ai. He walked straight through ruin. As they stood and they chose where to go, Lot would have gone right through Ai, directly east of where they were. And young people, as we were reading through these verses, six specific words should have caught our attention. Because we come across six verbs that are used in relation to the decision-making process. The decisions that are being made in these verses, six action words that are used to show what took place between these two men. They come out in verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. The first thing we notice is that the choices were sparked by visual options. Beheld and chose. Then we notice that the visual options that were available led to a decision to commit. He journeyed, but they separated. And lastly, that commitment becomes permanent and difficult to reverse. He dwelled, and he pitched. And so in verse 11, Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Now just by way of interest, Genesis 4 and verse 16 
Genesis 11 and verse 12. When Cain left the presence of God, he went east. When the whole earth was of one language and speech, they journeyed east to set up Abel. And here now Lot journeys east. It's a sad phrase to read that they separated themselves. That word separated, it's the same Hebrew word that's used in Psalm 22 and verse 14 for a bone out of joint. This was a painful process. This wasn't easy. It was like a bone that was out of joint when they separated themselves together. It would have been a painful goodbye. It's the same Hebrew word that's used by Ruth in Ruth 1 and verse 17. When she told Naomi that only death would separate them. And yet here are two men separated by quarreling herdsmen. And what a disaster this would turn out to be. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. We considered that point in the exhortation yesterday, the way of thinking that we've been called to develop as strangers and pilgrims, to be tent thinkers. And here it's important for us to recognize that the point of living in tents wasn't missing out on what a city offered. Instead, it was about maintaining distance from any influence that might take us away from God. We're instead looking for a city that God was preparing a brother once said that God's laws should not act as an enabler for a better life. Sorry, God's laws act as an enabler for a better life, not an inhibitor to the good life. But we can get that wrong at times in our own life, thinking that following after this book and God's laws are making us miss out on what the world can offer. But it shouldn't be seen that way. And this is where the struggle really starts for Lot. We're not given any more than what we have in the verses before us. We don't know all the motives behind the decision that was made. Did it have to do with the prospect of trade and, and commerce? And being near a city helps with a greater opportunity for that. Did it have to do with providing for a family by setting up operations in a city a bit more structured and, and permanent? We don't read of Lot's family until he's in Sodom, so was he motivated to see what the comfort and the culture of, a cir of this circuit offered as opposed to the wanderer's way of life that lay before him? Regardless of the motivation, the point remains. Decisions in life are not to be taken lightly. Making a decision for ourselves without the counsel of God can have negative effects. And concerning this decision and this choice by Lot, I just wanted to read what Brother H.P. Mansfield had to say. Because he could put things a lot better than I can. He says, there was much that Lot had chose to forget at that very moment. His eyes were filled with the prospects of an easy existence in the circuit of cities below. And dazzled by the materialism that beckoned, he became blind to the spiritual vision. It was like Egypt. Lot was foolish in separating himself from Abram. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off, says Proverbs 27.10. It is a command today to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, which actually is what Lot did. It becomes clear to us when we come over one page to Genesis chapter 14, because here we see the stark difference between Lot and Abram. We looked at this yesterday, put plainly, Lot was a dweller in Sodom. Abram was a Hebrew. There was a difference in their decision making. For Lot, it all started with simply pitching his tent beside Sodom. And yet it seems almost inevitable as to what would happen next. Sooner or later, the difference can become blurred, even in our own lives. And young people, one of the greatest lessons that we can learn early on in life is that we should never give the flesh the benefit of the doubt. It's an easy thing to do, isn't it? Sometimes we don't even realize it until it's too late, and we step outside only to find ourselves with our house brick upon brick next to Sodom. Just consider some examples. 
Sometimes, perhaps in our own lives, we might give the flesh the benefit of the doubt. We can start going down a bit of a slippery slope without even realizing it. What about a mindset that might say, I'm going away for school. It's not really close to an ecclesia. I'm living on campus, but it's not going to affect me. I'll be fine. I'll do the readings every night by myself. What about a mindset that says, yes, I know I'm dating this guy or girl from school. I know they're not interested in the truth, but they will be. I'll, I'll influence them for the positive. What about the mindset that says, I know I'm working at this bar or that club, but it's just a job. I need to pay the bill. What about a mindset that says, I know there's a, a party on Friday night with my school friends. Yes, I'll stop by. I won't drink. I won't stay late. I'm just going to go check it out. What about the mindset that says, yes, I know that my friends at school swear a lot, but I'm not affected by it. I can look past it. What about the mindset that says, yes, I know that movie is rated R, but I'm old enough to know what's right and wrong. Young people may start innocently enough. A decision we make, a choice to do something seemingly small. But if we give the flesh the benefit of the doubt, it may be all it needs. And it becomes critical in our own lives to consider the environment that we choose to put ourselves in. We have to understand that there are other factors that may determine where we live or where we go to school or where we work. But it's so important that we try as hard as we can to surround ourselves in an environment that fosters our development before God. Back home, we just went through uh, the process of moving to a new house. And part of that wonderful process is packing up all of your things, putting them in boxes, and then shipping those boxes off. I was going through some old pictures that I had from many years ago at the Manitoulin Bible Camp. And in one particular picture, it was a group of friends that I grew up with, that I attended Bible Camp with. There was 12 of us in this particular photo. Eight out of the twelve are no longer in the truth. Eight out of twelve. One week at a Bible camp, one week at a youth conference won't do it for us. That's not enough. We have to work tirelessly in our lives to put ourselves in the best situations to grow before God. We have to go where it's wholesome and good, where our spiritual character can be developed. And we can't help but notice the way that Sodom is brought to our attention in Genesis 13 and verse 13. It's interesting that it's Genesis 13, verse 13, given what 13 represents in the Bible. But look at the way that this, this place is brought up to us. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceeded them. <coughs> You get the sense that we're almost to read it as if questioning it. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom, but the men of Sodom were sinners. As if the reader were supposed to question it before we even get to Genesis 19. Why? We noted how Lot likened the well-watered plains of Jordan as the nearest surviving thing to Eden. Yet masked in that, veiled in that, was that he also likened it to Egypt. It was wicked. It was sinful. It was to be avoided. The word wicked there in Genesis 13, verse 13, it makes to break in pieces or to destroy. This wasn't a calm place. Not a peaceful place to spend time contemplating the things of God. The word sinners, it means to miss the mark. This place missed the target. They were wicked. They were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That word exceedingly is from the Hebrew word that means a poker. It's used for turning over embers in a fire. This place was full of people who poked and who prodded, hoping that they would turn you towards evil. And while their way of life would not have appealed to Lot, he still heads this way. A brother wrote concerning this city that all the riches in the world are not worth anything if your neighborhood's polluted. Better to dwell in a tent somewhere than to have a residence in a rotten neighborhood. 
and perhaps they question why God would allow Lot to do this. Knowing how wicked this city was, why allow him to venture this way? Well, verse 14 helps with that. Notice the choice of words. After that Lot was separated. Abram wasn't blamed for making him leave. God wasn't shown as having directed him. Lot was responsible for this decision and this choice and this location. And the lesson here is that just because God promises us deliverance from evil, it doesn't mean we won't go through the experience of evil. Deliverance and experience are different things. And while Lot was walking towards Sodom, let's just pick up in verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Careful reading, once again, helps us appreciate this decision-making process. God says to Abram, lift up now thy arms. It's almost as if his eyes were on the ground. It's almost as if it's telling us that Abram wasn't enticed by what Lot was. He didn't care for the cities in the plain. They didn't draw his attention the same way it did for Lot. So what should Lot have done? Well, to answer that, we're going to use a comparison of two other Bible characters. David and Saul. Seven times in the Bible, we have the exact phrase, David inquired of the Lord. Seven times, David specifically is called out for inquiring of the Lord. We know there would have been many other inferences to David doing this, but seven times that phrase is specifically called out. David, as a man after God's own heart, acted in accordance with the will of God. And the only way to accomplish that was to receive instruction from God. And just to highlight the importance of that type of behavior, to show that Perhaps this is what Lot should have done. Let's turn over to 1 Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10. We're going to begin reading in verse 13. It says, So Saul died. Why did he die? For his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit, familiar spirit, to inquire of him, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. David's first thought before he acted was to go to God. It's a valuable lesson as we start to see these events unfold in Lot's life. You can still be righteous, yet fail to make the best decision because the process wasn't done properly. Certainly Lot would come to regret this decision. I think there could be no doubt about that. This would be one decision that he would regret. And young people, we have the opportunity as we study the character of Lot, as we study these chapters, to work on our own spiritual decision-making process. Just think through in your own minds to a decision you made that you now regret. Oftentimes it's because we didn't have a proper process in place. By way of example, one of the biggest regrets uh, growing up was a direct result of myself not having a proper plan in place to really think through it to make smarter decisions. I remember once, it was a Saturday, my cousin was over, and uh, my younger brother Mark and I went out with my cousin, and it was wintertime, so we were outside for most of the day. 
And across from our house, there was a forest, and on the other side of that forest was a major road. <coughs> so we go up to the forest, we make snowballs, and we start throwing snowballs at the cars that are passing by. Well, we hit a truck. We hit him hard, and unbeknownst to us, he was pretty angry. So we turned around, and he pulled into our survey. He ran up the hill into the woods, and he starts screaming at us as he's running towards us. Well, we hear him coming, and the first reaction is just to run. So my cousin and I take off. My brother's five years younger. This was a number of years ago. So he's much slower, and he gets caught. And this man, being very angry, takes my brother, puts him in his car, and drives away, trying to find our house. That experience affected my brother for many years. I didn't really realize it. I didn't know how it was going to affect him because I was down the street running. But if I had a proper process in place to make smarter decisions, we probably wouldn't have been up on that hill in the first place. And we certainly wouldn't have been throwing snowballs at cars. Sometimes we just need to make smarter decisions. We need to have a better plan in place to make those decisions. And in our big decisions, we have to include God. We need to inquire of the Lord to ensure we don't end up with our tent next to Sodom. So having looked through Genesis 13, recognizing the importance of a proper decision-making process, perhaps seeing some parallels to our own life, what are some of the exhortations for us? Firstly, like Abram, who started this chapter back in Bethel, at times in our lives, we might need a fresh start. There's no better place than the house of God. Where better to seek guidance than in the arena of truth? When we have to make decisions, let's go back to the house of God. Secondly, we noted the butterfly effect in the early verses of Genesis 13. The seemingly small issues over just disputed land that caused Lot to leave in the first place. And while it appeared to be a small decision, even the small things can have big consequences. It's said that the travesty of Lot's life is that he stuck with Abraham in adversity and divided from him in prosperity. And while a small thing to simply move just to another place, we know the consequences that this had on Lot and his family. So in our own lives, even if we're making small decisions, let's think it through. Let's work through that same process to ensure that we understand potential consequences, that we make the right spiritual decision. Thirdly, let's take a warning from the life of Lot, and let's be careful as to the environment that we choose to be in. Lot allowed other things to influence his decision. For him, it was Egypt. What about for us? What do we confuse the promised land with? Let's work hard in our lives now to get the right mindset for making spiritual decisions. Let the mind of the master be the master of your mind. Start to work very hard to develop the characteristics of Christ so that we too will not confuse the promised land for anything. And we'll get through anything just as Christ did with a mind looking to the future. If we can do that, no doubt our decisions will be in line with the will of our Heavenly Father. And lastly, let's keep in mind throughout this study the words of Romans 15 and verse 4. That the life of Lot is there for us to learn from. Oftentimes, young people, we attempt to rehabilitate Bible characters. But their choices, their errors, are there for us to learn from. So let's do the same for law. I just want to conclude with a quote from Brother Alfred Norris. The young people, the incredible thing about this quote is that he wrote it back in 1979. I edited just a few words just to be more fitting for our day and age. I changed periodicals to magazines, just for example. But his words are as true then as they are today. 
He said every businessman can think of his own parallels to going into Sodom for business reasons. Every ambitious young woman can think of hers for reasons of personal satisfaction and marital security. Every husband or wife whose partner minds earthly things knows the tension between the call of divine privilege, pilgrimage, and the attraction of the city life. Every isolated family or scattered ecclesia which has, been, which has seen the Christian hopes of the next generation melt away in worldly <coughs> marriages knows the difficulties in which the situation involved the family of Lot. And everyone knows, clearly, the difference between finding ourselves in these situations from choice and entering into them from force of circumstance. In the face of the unclean thing, the scriptural injunction is not to go into it, and trust instead that God will keep us from being defiled. From being defiled. We are to come out and to be separate, to touch it not. If we would not now be able to identify Sodom with any particular city in our lives, we can certainly identify it with particular places within our cities, with particular habits within our own homes, with particular shows on particular devices, with particular magazines, with particular company, and scarcely anyone needs to be told what is intended. The false confidence that we can touch these things without being defiled is no substitute. There are sodomite things which ought not to be touched, nor named, nor even desired among the saints. So young people, when you're faced with a big decision in your life, what's the process that you go through in your mind to make the right spiritual decision? Let's take a lesson from Genesis chapter 13. Let's take a lesson from the life of Lot. Let's purpose in our hearts to involve God in our decisions. To lift our minds to things eternal, to help shape and guide our footsteps. And if we find ourselves with our tent next to Sodom, the answer to that problem is in Genesis 19. And we'll look into that tomorrow.